Gentleman's name Gene Salaker. Does that fit right? Yep, that's right. All right. He's from. He lives in River Grove, Illinois, which is right kind of in the little west side of Chicago. Graduate of Northwestern University, he retired police officer and middle school teacher. Author of two books. Disaster on the Mississippi, The Sultana Explosion, April 21st, 1865, and The Second Pearl Harbor, The West Lawton Disaster, May 21st, 1944. Gene owns the largest private collection of Sultana artifacts and memorabilia, which is currently on loan to the Sultana Disaster Museum located in Marion, Arkansas, which is in West Memphis. Right, right across the river. Right across the river, before you cross the bridge. So we have a warm welcome. Hi, Ken, welcome. All right. Thank you. All mine. Okay. Actually, one one correction. I've written five books. Oh. Not just two. I've written five. But, oh, that's okay. But one of them's out of print, so it's only four books. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're here today to talk about the Sultana disaster. And there is a, as I had mentioned while I was sitting here, there is a Pittsfield slash Griggsville connection uh, with the fellow that was responsible for overloading the Sultana. So let me let me start where I usually do. And the Sultana, this is a uh, picture of the Sultana. It was a side wheel steamboat that had been built in February of 1863, right in about the center of the middle of the Civil War. Uh, built in Cincinnati. It was built to eventually be used as a cotton packet going down the river all the way to New Orleans and back up you know, between St. Louis and New Orleans. But at this point, when it was built, the Confederates were still hanging on to Vicksburg, Mississippi. But the person that had this uh, boat built, uh, Preston Lodwick was his name, he knew that eventually Vicksburg's going to fall, the Mississippi's going to go get open. And boy, how much money they could get getting down into the south and getting cotton and bringing it back up to the textile mills up here in the north. So you knew there'd be a lot of money uh, there. So uh, it was built in Cincinnati, and eventually will drop down to the Mississippi River. And uh, eventually, uh, after about a year and a half, Preston Lodwick will sell the boat to, to a, uh, a group of people from uh, St. Louis. And one of them is going to end up as the captain of the boat. His name is James Cass Mason. He was 34 years old when he bought into the Sultana. And he originally buys one eighth share. But James Cass Mason had a reputation as a uh, uh, running a fast boat, sort of a lead foot, like you know you call, call somebody lead foot today when they race their cars up and down the blocks and stuff like that. And that's what he did. He was very uh, hard on the boilers on his boats, uh, hard on the engines on his boats. In fact, when he buys into the Sultana, he owns a one eighth share, and uh, at, at two different points he damages so that the hull. You know, he runs into some sunken. Uh, rocks and stuff like that. And rather than having the boat repaired right away, he will put up a temporary you know, uh, fix on the boat and go all the way down to New Orleans, which is risking the lives of the passengers and risking the, the freight that's on board. But he goes, you know, he, will not, he will not turn away a penny. If he would have had the boat repaired, he would have had to put his passengers on a different boat or his freight on a different boat, and he'd have lost that money. He's not going to do that. So he'll go down to New Orleans and then back up, and then he gets the boat repaired. Well, every time he damages it, this is costing him money. The boilers have had it been repaired a couple times. Again, that's costing money. This is only about a year and a half old boilers. They shouldn't be giving you this much trouble. He eventually starts hurting for money. He sells off half of his share to his clerk. So he now owns a, a 1 16th share. And then, uh, actually, I'm taking it back, he owned a 1 quarter. He sold it back, now he owned a 1 8. And even that, his clerk could not pay him. His clerk did not have the money. So he ends up selling his half of his 1 8. So he ends up being a 1 16th minority owner on the Sultana. He's looking for money. This guy is looking for money. Well, on the night of April 14th, he is downbound with the Sultana going down from St. Louis down to New Orleans, and they stop at Cairo, Illinois. And while they're at Cairo, Illinois, the next morning, through the telegraph, news comes in that Abraham Lincoln has been assassinated. He was shot in, in Ford Theater uh, in Washington. They think that he's dead. They think that Secretary, well, they, they know he's dead, but Secretary Stewart had his throat cut. Uh, they thought that he had died. He had not. But this is the information that Cairo gets. James Cass Mason says, wow, if I can get this information on the Sultana uh, and get it down river, be the first boat to leave Cairo and go down river, I will be the messenger of death 
and it'll make a name for the Sultana. This is the boat that spread the news of, of uh, Lincoln's uh, passing. Um, why does he have to do this? Because the telegraphic communications with the South has been torn up because of the war. There's no way that Vicksburg or Memphis or New Orleans would know about this unless you bring these newspapers. So he grabs an armload of newspaper and shoots down the river. Uh, and he will stop at all the different ports. He only, he's trying to stay ahead of the other steamboats which are chasing him. And so he's only there for a couple hours or whatever at, at, at these different places. Well, he eventually ends up at Vicksburg, Mississippi. And when he pulls in there, not only does he send runners into the city with some newspapers to give to the generals and stuff like that, but he is visited by our friend, Captain Reuben Benton Hatch from uh, Griggsville and, and the Pittsfield. He actually marries a woman from Pittsfield. Reuben Benton Hatch comes on board the Sultana because just outside, he is the chief quartermaster, the person in charge of the uniforms and the food and everything like that for, this, for the city and the, the Union soldiers around Vicksburg. But just outside of Vicksburg is a parole camp. What has happened is this is April of 1865. The Civil War is almost over. Lincoln got assassinated on, uh, shot on April 14th, 1865. He dies on the morning of April 15th. So this is uh, uh, middle of April, 1865, and the South is falling apart. Prisoners from Andersonville Prison and from Cahaba Prison are uh, being released by the Confederacy and brought over to Vicksburg to be sent home. But they're not being released right away. They are sent over to Vicksburg, they're put in this big parole camp, and they're waiting for southern soldiers that are up in the north to be released and sent down, and they will exchange them one for one. You give us a southern private, we'll give you a, a northern private, and, you, and a northern captain and a, and a southern captain, we'll exchange. Problem is, is that none of the southern prisoners are being released. So all these guys are piling up around Vicksburg and they're waiting there and they're waiting there and they're waiting there. Which actually turns out to be a, a, a blessing in disguise because they, they do nothing. They don't drill, they get up in the morning, they take roll call and then they're on their own. They're eating, they're sitting around, they're relaxing, they're putting on a little bit of weight that they had lost when they were in prison. However, the men from Cahaba prison, which is in, in uh, Alabama, just a little bit south of Selma, very little known prison because it's not one where everybody died as, as they did in Andersonville. This is a typical picture of a, so, of a soldier that was released from Andersonville. Eponidas W. McIntosh with the 14th Illinois Infantry. Um, he is being held up by, this is a drawing of course, but he's being held up and these little things here, these are scurvy sores on him from not getting any vitamin C while he was in prison. But you can see his ribs and everything. He went into prison weighing, uh, weighing approximately 150 pounds. When he was released, he was 70 pounds. 70 pounds. So he's sitting at this Camp Fisk, this parole camp, and he's, at least he's eating and gaining a little bit of weight. He will not get on the Sultana. He has put on another boat, uh, the Henry Ames, and sent up river. But he got off at Memphis and was left behind. When the Sultan eventually comes up, he just says, well, I'll just get on with these guys. Little did he know that <laughs> he's getting out of bad boat. Um, but he says, when the boat exploded, he jumped into the river, and he actually finds a couple little pieces of wood and hangs on to those. He said, if I would have weighed 150, those little pieces of wood would not have kept me afloat. So he said, by losing all that weight, that actually saved his life. And he says the immersion in the cold April 1865 water, that's, that's snow runoff from the north is flowing down into the Mississippi, Mississippi River, a river that had a flood. He says the cold actually helped his scurvy sores. So he, you know, he was one of the few guys that said, the Sultana actually did me good <laughs> as compared to these other guys. This other person here, he was held at Cahaba prison. You can see not quite as, as bad. The, the, uh, the guy in charge of Cahaba was a, a Methodist uh, uh, preacher uh, before the war. He become a, a, a lieutenant colonel during the war. They put him in charge of this, this uh, prison camp. Uh, once before during the war, he had uh, contacted the Union authorities in Vicksburg and said, my guys are starving, their clothes are falling apart, can you send us some? So the Union authorities did. They sent food and clothing to uh, Cahaba to help his guys. Near the end of the war, he did the same thing. He contacts them and says, could you send more food and more clothing? 
And that's when they said, instead of keeping them there, why don't you bring them to Vicksburg? We'll clothe them and we'll feed them. So that's what started this exchange camp. When Andersonville heard about this, they did the same thing. They sent their men over here. So now Reuben Hatch will jump aboard the Sultana when it arrives at uh, Vicksburg, and he says, Captain Mason, I know you're hurting for money. I've seen your boat. I've heard of, you know, your, your, your boilers are bad and stuff like that. And, he, and, and Hatch is hurting for money, too. You'll hear in just a second why. He says, I'll cut a deal with you. I'm a quartermaster. I will guarantee you at least 1,000 men to take up river if you, if you will give me a payback. Because the United States government is, is paying for each person to go up river $2.75 or $8 per officer. If he can put 1,000 guys on board, that's $2,750. If he can give a kickback of about a buck a piece on all these guys, Hatch will make money, Mason will make money. Mason says, this is a guarantee. Oh, I guarantee you, you will get your men. Okay, good. Mason will then get back on the Sultana and go down river to uh, uh, New Orleans. Now this is that Camp Fist, this is what it says up here, this is the parole camp. We have, there was a picture taken, we have identified several of the people, but this fellow right here, we think might be, we don't know who he is, but that might be Reuben Hatch. And here is why I say that, this guy here. There's the picture of Hatch from a couple different images, there you can see a real clear one and a little bit foggier. This is his brother, his brother Ozias M. Hatch was the Secretary of State of Illinois very influential person. This is his brother. Tell me, is there a similarity there? There sure is. There sure is. They have the same sort of forehead, the same beard, <coughs> the, the, the long, sort of a long drawn out face. But we are not sure. I can't say that's him. It sure looks like him, but I don't know. However, I've just recently come across on the internet from the Birmingham Public Library they have a picture of this, and underneath here it has one, two, three, four, five numbers under the people. And I just wrote to Birmingham and I said, please, please tell me that on the back of that picture it tells you who number one, number two, number three, number four. We're really interested, and I think it's number eight. We want to find out if that's hatched. So I'm on to it, people. That's why Bob, I didn't even tell you. I'm looking, I'm looking. So. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get a picture of this guy uh, one way or the other. Just interject there. there, uh -huh. there there's a few other pictures we have, and I'm sure you've seen them. Yeah. There's the oldest Hatch brother, which is Seth. Right. Yes. Followed in yes. the father's footsteps. Yes. Doctor of Civil War. Right. He is almost spot on to that photo in the middle. I agree. I agree. Yeah. But but again, without it without right. a definitive yeah. saying, we don't know. It sure looks like it. Yeah, but I can't say that's him. Has the beard, longer beard. Right, longer. right, right, yes, yes. Now, who was Reuben Hatch? Well, Hatch was actually born in, uh, in New Hampshire, but he will move to Griggsville in 1835 when he was, what, 16 years old. He uh, takes and he will eventually open up a merchant store, in, uh, in general st a store in Meridotia. So, I think I'm pronouncing that correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Good. Correct. Fair notion. Okay. So uh, he opens up this general store. He's a merchant and everything. Eventually, what happens is uh, he will marry from Pittsfield here, Ellen DeWitt Bush. Now, I did not know this until I was here last summer when Bob and I uh, rode around. But one of the things is that near near the end of his life, he will work for is it Colonel Bush? No. Uh, the the the, the building. It's, well, it's her father. It's her fa her father. He will end up working for her father. So there's a Bush building next to the uh, hotel. It's her brother. Her brother. Okay. He was the editor for the paper. Okay. Many many years. All right. But I, I'm now staying at what's the name of the hotel? Then I'm. It, it's the Bush building. The Bush building. Yeah. That's that's. He's going to be involved with that. You'll hear about that in a little bit. But this is the daughter or the the sister of the person with the Bush building. So that's who he marries. He will have seven kids. Uh, he, he came, he, take back nine. He came from a family of nine, he has nine kids also. Uh, 
His brother, as I said, Oziah Semhash, uh, will actually get into the business with him, the uh, general merchandising business with him for a while. Uh, and he had been a state legislator at one time, so he's interested in politics. Uh, eventually, uh, Reuben Hatch and company will open a store in Quincy. So now they're along the Mississippi River. And we think that this is where he will meet a number of steamboat captains and steamboat crews and such like pilots and everything like that by his store on, uh, on Quincy on the Mississippi River. Uh, eventually what happens is he will, he, because his brother is so into politics, he sort of follows along a little bit and they represent uh, the Whigs at a Whig convention in Sterling, uh, Illinois. And at that convention was a young lawyer, Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln and Hatch are not uh, strangers to each other. They know each other because Abraham Lincoln has represented Hatch in a number of lawsuits either that Hatch has filed against other people through his business or other people have filed against him. And Lincoln at one point is, is his lawyer and it got to be that, that uh, uh, he will be his lawyer for three years on a case that will eventually go to the Illinois Supreme Court. It goes all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court before Lincoln wins the case and files in, in favor for Reuben Hatch. Now to show that these guys, they were just not a lawyer client thing, they were friends. One of Lincoln's, or one of Hatch's kids will say, Lincoln dropped into our home on a number of occasions. I remember the tall, gaunt figure. He played and chatted with us children and was always bright and cheerful. Now, a regular lawyer doesn't get down on the floor and play with the kids and stuff like that. Uh, so there was this, this friendship relation between Lincoln and Hatch. Now, when the war begins, uh, Reuben Hatch uh, he, even though he's, what, 42 years old, he joins up um, with the, there he is, 41 years old, he joins up with the 8th uh, Illinois Infantry. That's actually the first infantry unit uh, of Civil War soldiers. He joins up as a first lieutenant, and he is, because he, he's a general, in charge of general stores, they make him a quartermaster. He's going to be the person that purchases all the equipment for the Army whether it's shoes, whether it's pants, whether it's jackets, whether it's food, hats, whatever, Reuben Hatch is in charge of that. But being a quartermaster for your company or your regiment is not good enough for him. He wants a little more. So he actually takes and he writes to, to Lincoln and says, can't you do something? And President Lincoln, one of his friends, oops, I'm pushing that the laser <laughs> button. Uh, one of his friends, Lincoln, says, please let R.B. Reuben B. Hatch of Illinois be appointed as assistant quartermaster. So he wants a higher job. He writes to Lincoln. Lincoln writes to the head of the quartermaster in Washington and says, please let him do it. Lincoln is loyal to his friends. That's one thing you will learn on this talk is Lincoln is very loyal to his friends. Eventually, Hatch is made the chief quartermaster in charge of Cairo, Illinois. Not just a regimental quartermaster, but now he's in charge of all these regiments that are showing up to try to keep Illinois excuse me, Illinois in the Union. There was, a, there was a, a, a possibility that the southern part of Illinois might break away and join the Confederacy because a lot of people in the southern part of Illinois had migrated from Kentucky and from Tennessee. Uh, so they're, they're hanging on to it through this. Now, when he's down there, he hears that uh, two of his children have died of diphtheria. He goes back up to Pittsfield, Griggsville, Illinois area, and he buries his kids. Uh, he turns to the bottle. He was always a drinker, always a drinker. But I think after this, it really pushed him over the head edge, and he becomes a full-blown alcoholic. Um, he will. There will be talk about this in the army, and, and there's a, a a new book out on General Grant, and I forgot Chernoff, I think is the guy's name, or something like that. And he, and. Um, he mentions in there that, that somebody on Grant's staff was the person that started the rumors that Grant was an alcoholic. That was Hatch. Hatch was the guy that was the full-blown alcoholic. And when Grant uh, you know, clamps down on him, he starts saying, you know, well, he's an alcoholic too. So this is one of the guys that helped spread those rumors about Grant uh, liking his alcohol. Well, he goes down to, goes up to Quincy, buries his kids comes back down to Cairo and he finds out he's got a new boss. General Grant is his boss in Cairo. And Grant starts hearing rumors about the quartermaster's department, that there's been some shady dealings going on, which Hatch is in charge of. He finds out that 
Hatch had been buying horses for the government at a certain price and selling them, basically charging the government. Uh, 17 of the best horses, what has happened is, I, let me go back for just a second, the, the uh, Union soldiers have been spreading out into Kentucky, across the river into Kentucky, into Missouri, and they're raiding Confederate camps and they're grabbing the Confederate horses though. They are now United States property. Hatch looks at 17 of the best of them and sends them home to his farm. You know, and this is illegal. You're not supposed to be doing that. That's government property. And, and other people are, they were put in the paper that they're looking for horses. People would bring a herd of horses in there, and he would say, sorry, you know, we've got enough. We don't need them. You can wait. We might need them in a month. Put them in a stable over there, and you, you can pay the stable fees and the feeding fees and the watering fees and everything like that. Or, you know what? We'll buy them from you, but instead of paying $5 a horse, we'll only give you a dollar a horse. Well, what do you do? Do you take those horses back, or do you stable them up and for a month? So they would sell them the hatch for a dollar. As soon as the guy rode away, they sell them to the government for five bucks. They're pocketing the four dollars themselves. So Hatch is making money as a quartermaster. Grant starts hearing this. But the biggest scandal comes with the lumber scandal from Chicago. Hatch had said one of his, uh, well, it's getting to be winter time, uh, 1861, and they're going to have to build some winter barracks around the Carroll area. And he sends uh, uh, one of his men up to Chicago to buy lumber. Well, they end up buying the lumber for 500,000 feet of lumber. They take and they buy it for $9.50 a foot, but they charge the government $10.50, a dollar extra. When you're talking about 500,000 feet, that's a lot of money, people, even at a dollar extra. So they're making this. Well, the Chicago Tribune finds out about, out about this and writes an article. Grant sees the article and says, what? We're being ripped off? So he's going to take and he's going to, Grant is going to send one of his people up there uh, to, uh, oops, back this up. He sends one of his people up there to Chicago to look into this. But Grant made a mistake. He sent Hatch with him. <laughs> so, so they go up there, and Hatch contacts all the lumber dealers. Now, the, the guy that he sends, sends with him, this guy Wilcox, he says, he says, you take and you go to uh, the Tribune and find out what's happening. And, and uh, in the meantime, Hatch takes and contacts all the lumber guys and says, guys, come to my hotel room. So they all go there, and he says, you know, we just heard that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, we, you, go to, you wrote a contract to sell the lumber for $9.50, and some, some scoundrel is selling it for $10.50. Well, I have nothing to do with that. First off, Hatch says, he says, but I'll tell you what, you guys have been so good, we're going to give you $10 instead of the $9.50. The lumber dealer says, okay. They get their money. Hatch walks out of the room. The lead lumber dealer says, guys, we only signed a contract for $9.50. He's given us the 50 cents extra. Why don't we give it to Hatch? He's such a nice guy. <laughs> Nobody knew that this guy and Hatch were working together. Collusion. Boy, where have we heard that word before? <laughs> so, so they've been colluding with each other. So they get the extra money, and of course, this guy splits it with Hatch. Now, Hatch rushes back to Springfield, or down to, to Cairo, I should say. And when this guy Wilcox finds out that not only would he talk to the Tribune, but he found out that Hatch had this meeting in his room, he's furious. He rushes down to Cairo and has Hatch arrested uh, uh, for, for uh, was it uh, duty unbecoming of an officer? Okay, so he is arrested on that. Yet, because he is an officer, he's a captain now, he is allowed to stay, walk, roam around Cairo, he's not thrown into, into a jail and all like that. And, um, they're going to have a court martial, but in the meantime, Grant is actually working to come up with more. He's finding out more and more stuff about this guy. The guy is, is he's taking, he's, he's, he's using, uh, selling government saddles to private citizens and pocketing the money. Uh, he's renting uh, uh, steamboats at a higher, you know, at, a, at like $1,000 a month, but he's charging the government $3,000 a month and pocketing the money. I mean, everything this guy's doing is illegal. Um, now the problem is, is that is that uh, Hatch had two sets of books. One book he kept for himself, so he knew how much money he was making. The other set of books he had, if you wanted to see it, I'll show you. See, everything's up and up. But this book over here, you ain't seeing. Well, remember, he can roam around the city. When he hears that Grant's going to go 
searching the, the quartermaster office for his books, he takes and throws them in the Ohio River. <laughs> he throws, puts them in a sack, throws them in the Ohio River. But they washed up on shore. <laughs> <laughs> he's, not, he's not the brightest guy. He's not the brightest guy. So they have his books. This guy is in trouble. They got, they got his books right there. Well, that's when he starts saying, well, I need to contact my influential friends. And he contacts Orville Hickam Browning, who was a friend of Lincoln, now the, a U.S. Senator in Washington, D.C., from the state of Illinois. He contacts Jackson Grimshaw. That may be a name that's familiar with some people. Um, he's a friend of Lincoln. Uh, who's, he's Hatch's lawyer. Also, he was so tight with Hatch that Hatch named one of his kids Jackson Grimshaw Hatch. So um, these guys are tight. Of course, he contacts his brother, who's now the Secretary of State of Illinois. He contacts uh, Richard J. Ogilvie, who will become the governor of Illinois after the war. But during the war, he was in charge of the 8th Illinois Infantry. He was Hatch's colonel at the time. He contacts the governor of Illinois, Yates. And he contacts uh, Jesse Dubois, who is the state auditor. So he's got some influential friends. And they, he tells them, please write letters to Lincoln. Bombard Lincoln and see if you can get me off of being court martial. I didn't do anything wrong. This is all trumped up charges. Uh, I can't word. Maybe that was a bad word to use. Uh, trumped up charges, sorry. Uh, so what happens is, let me see what I got here. Uh, Lincoln sends a letter to the judge advocate. Of course, the judge advocate general is the top lawyer in the land. And Lincoln says, I personally know RB, Captain RB Hatch and never before heard anything, it should be one word, anything against his character. If the judge advocate has the means of doing so, I will thank him to give me his opinion in the case. So, so Lincoln is stepping in. Again, he's loyal to his friends. Stepping in for Hatch and said, I've never heard anything bad about this guy. Please look into this. Well, the judge advocate sends the information to Henry Halleck, General Henry Halleck in, in St. Louis. Henry Halleck hates Grant. He, Grant, he thinks, is, is, a, is a showboater. He's always out for, you know, uh, 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 publicity. And Halleck hates him just hands down. So when he hears that Grant is the guy that had Hatch arrested, he overrules Grant and has Hatch released without, without even really looking into it. Unfortunately for Hatch, we had a new Secretary of War come along, uh, Edwin Stanton. Edwin Stanton looked through the papers and said, no. I want him rearrested. So, so Hatch is rearrested by Edwin Stanton. Uh, Major Lincoln nudges Hatch, uh, nudged by Hatch's friends again, writes, uh, oh, it puts, I'm sorry, it puts together a special presidential commission to look into Reuben Hatch. And what they find out was they examined 1,696 claims against this guy. Wow. <laughs> that's against one, that's a lot. And, and, they said a very small percentage of the claims were rejected because of fraud. Okay, most of them, eh, we can see where it where happened. And in fact, the ones that maybe he did something wrong, we think they were just purely accidental. <laughs> so we covered for this guy. They give it to Secretary of War Stanton. He reads it and he says, this is a whitewash. This is a cover-up. You know what? I'm not even going to have it printed up. I'm not going to release it to the public. So he knows that Hatch is dirty. Stanton refused to have it released. Later on, Stanton gets a letter from Lincoln saying, the commission at Cairo investigated the accounts of R.B. Hatch and utterly failed to find anything wrong and thinks the charges against him and his arrest are wrong. I desire to release R.B. Hatch from arrest and return him to duty. Once again, Lincoln is involving himself with Reuben Hatch. Now, you also have to remember that Hatch, Hatch's brother, Ozias and Hatch, is a very good friend with Lincoln. You guys have here somewhere a photograph. Is it's it in the, the tent? tent? Yes. In the tent, there's a photograph of Abraham Lincoln when he went to, in uh, September of 1862, he went to Antietam, uh, Maryland, Sharpsburg, Maryland, to visit General McClellan's army. That was the, the Army of Potomac there. The man who went with him is Ozias M. Hatch. And in a handwritten letter that you guys have, or not a letter, it's a, it's a photograph, it has written by Ozias M. Hatch, his brother, this is the tent, or something like that, this is the tent that Lincoln and I stayed in mm -hmm. when we visited McClellan. So Lincoln and him were tent mates 
when they visited. And he's in the photograph with Abraham Lincoln. So that's how tight the hatches and the Lincolns were. So now you know why Lincoln is going to bat for hatch. Stanton drags his feet until eventually Lincoln basically forces him uh, to, to release uh, Hatch. Hatch will then go down to uh, Helena, Arkansas. He's down there for a little bit, and then he resigns from the Army. After all this trouble and stuff like that, he finally says, you know, this is, this is just too much. I'm too old. I, I, I'm, he's an alcoholic. He's been drinking. He says, that's it. I'm going home to my stores. He goes home to Grigsville here, and uh, on August 8th, uh, well, he's on, on November 19th, block here in, in Griggsville, uh, or sorry, there in Griggsville, will burn down, and his store burns down with it. He's not insured. So he loses his store and all the money. He did not start it. <laughs> we can't blame that on him. But his store burns out, and because of that, he wants back into the army. He, he, he petitions to come back in, but here's the problem. All of you guys that are veterans here, you know, if you ask to leave the army or resign, you just don't go home. You got to wait till it's approved. He had just gone home, so technically he's he walked, absent without leave. The judge advocate, uh, or, I'm sorry, quartermaster general, General Meg says, "This is our out. I can keep him out of the mill because he knows that Hatch is a dirty name. I can keep, I can keep him out because he went a wall, and I can say, well, sorry, you know, you walked away, you're out of here." But again. He petitions, he writes people and everything, and Lincoln gets involved again and says, I know not whether it can be done conveniently, but if it can't, I would like Hatch reinstated. <laughs> Lincoln again gets involved, and Hatch is reinstated on March 12, uh, 1864. He will have to go down to, uh, he has put it, he, he's, he's attached to the 13th Army Corps, which is trying to capture Shreveport, Louisiana, the capital of Louisiana in what's called the Red River Campaign. This is one of the biggest disasters for the Union Army. They get their gunboats and stuff up the Red River, and then the river starts to drop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, uh-oh, we're going to get these things out of here. So they got to quick try to go back. And in fact, they get stuck where they actually have to build a dam to build the water up enough to get the boats out of there. Um, he takes his while, a, a, a hatch takes a long time getting there. When he eventually reaches them, uh, he gets something called Fistula in Aino. It is a uh, very bad uh, disruption between your, your anal ca uh, cavity and like a hip or something like that. In other words, um, he's not going to the bathroom in a normal way. It is coming out from a side. Very painful. It is a pain in the ass. <laughs> which is which is apropos since he was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> no, I have to say that, sorry. We're all adults. So so he decides with this painful disease that he can no longer stay in the military and he quits for a second time. And he went home again. Uh, eventually he will receive, while he's at home with Grimsville, he'll re receive a notice saying go down to New Orleans for a test on whether you're qualified to be a quartermaster. Suddenly with his store down and there was some troubles with his wife, she had lost a house and stuff like that, uh, actually had to move, in, move down here to Pittsfield, um, he says, okay, maybe I do want to go back in. But he hears that this is just, don't worry about it. They're going to give you a test on quartermaster, but don't worry about it. Just go down there and, and uh, just show up, basically. It's that easy. Well, when he showed up, he shows up in a civilian unit, civilian clothes. They said, wait a minute, this is a military, you know, test. You're supposed to be in your uniform. He says, well, I lost it on that Red River campaign. But the Red River campaign was nine months ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they said, you only had one uniform? And you haven't replaced your uniform in nine months? Uh, okay, so he starts off on a bad note. They give him the test. They test him on his knowledges of accounting principles used for his bookkeeping and his ledgers, and on his knowledge of the forms that you would fill out for the quartermaster. Now, he's been a quartermaster since April, or since 1861. This is now, you know, early 1865. He should know in three years what he's doing. He fails. He fails so miserably that they say, of the 60 officers who have appeared before this board, not more than one or two can compare with Captain Hatch in degrees of deficiency. 
His accounting deficiency in view of his long period of service must be ascribed either to culpable negligence, in other words, he just doesn't care, or to incapacity, in other words, he's stupid. <laughs> I place it on the latter, but <laughs> that's personal. Uh, in either case, he is totally unfit to discharge the duties of assistant quartermaster. They recommend that this guy be kicked out of the service. But as you all know, it takes a while before government gets around to doing things. In the meantime, he is promoted, or not promoted, but he is made the chief quartermaster in charge of Vicksburg. And he is there at Vicksburg when the Sultana shows up and he cuts that deal with Captain Mason. When your steamboat goes down river to New Orleans and you come back, when you come back here, I will guarantee you 1,000 men if you can cut me some money. You, now you know why he needed the money. His store had burned down. His wife had had trouble saving the house and stuff like that. He needs money. He knows that Captain Mason is hurting for money. I'll guarantee you some money if you kick some back to me. Mason agrees. The steamboat will go down to New Orleans, load up with a few passengers, and come back up river. And as it is nearing Vicksburg, it actually sprang a leak in the boilers. That's because, again, Mason raced his boats. He had trouble with his boilers. Um, this is what the boilers look like on a steamboat. You have the coal and stuff is thrown in here, and it's actually thrown on top of some metal grating. There's a door here. You open the door, you throw a shovel full of coal on top of the metal grating, and that's what this piece is here. This was taken from the farmer's field where the sultana is buried. It's really, really heavy, but these would be up like this, and it would be like a grill uh, in your backyard. You have all these things, and you throw the coal on top of it as the coal burns. It gets ash on it, and this is called a shaker plate because they would bang this with, with their shovels and they would shake it, and the ash would roll off, and the heat, the coal would start heat, you know, become hotter again. So this is an actual piece from the Sultana. Um, these are furnace bricks. So the furnace, the bricks would be around this area here, and click encasing your furnace. What happens is your heat goes up through this underneath the boilers. It goes through some tubes in the boilers. There's actually tubes that go through the hot air, and then the hot air goes up the chimney. As this hot air goes through here, it heats the water inside the, the boiler. Uh, it will take The steam will go up into the steam drum through this to the engines, and that's what gets your steamboat going. They will end up having a leak up in the forward part up here. They slow the boat down, and they limp into the fixed boat. They will get the, the boat repaired, and as they are repairing the steamboat, it is being loaded with soldiers. In fact, a lot of the soldiers will write, and as we were getting on board, we could hear them hammering uh, the bulge back. It, it, what happened was two side plates had bulged a little, and it had started dripping water. A boiler mechanic will want to cut that bulge section out and rivet on a new section. Um, the chief engineer and Captain Mason say, no, you can't do that, because that's going to take a couple days. And if you do that, our steamboat will be tied up, and other boats will come up river and get those thousand men. So they say, can't you just pound the bulge back and mm -hmm. rivet a sheet on top of it, which is what they do. Um, as it turns out, though, this explosion I'm going to tell you about <coughs> did not come from that patch. So even though it was poorly patched, it had nothing to do with, the, with the, the, the disaster. But that, again, shows you how bad Mason was at, at keeping his boilers in tip-top shape. Well, they will, all day long, they will put the, these men are released from um, this parole camp, and they're put on trains and sent into the into the, the city, where they start loading up. And you can see on this, I keep trying to push that thing. Uh, you can see how the boat is loading up with people. Eventually, the Sultana will end up with 300,000 pounds of sugar in the hold, in the bottom, in these big barrels they call hogsheads. That's not bad. It actually acts as a ballast inside the hold. You also had over or almost 100 government horses and mules on board the Sultana. You have 70 paying passengers, people that had bought tickets before these soldiers started coming and they're sort of stuck there. You also have 85 crew men and women on board, 22 guards of the 58th Ohio Infantry who are there to make sure that there's no fights, no, you know, that these guys are getting fed and stuff like that. And uh, we had 1,961 parole prisoners. They thought they were going to get 1,000. 
they thought maybe as many as 1,400. The officers lose count of these guys, and eventually 1,961 people, soldiers, are put on board. A total of 2,138 people on a boat. That so about 450 people. Instead, they have almost 2,200 people on board. Talk about being crowded. And don't let me forget, there was also a pet alligator. <laughs> we don't know his name, but there was a pet alligator that some people said was six feet, some guys said it was eight feet. I'm sure if you've never seen an alligator or you've seen it up close, it looks a lot larger than it really is. But it was in a sturdy wooden crate, and it was their, it was their pet. It was their mascot. But the soldiers had never seen an alligator that close, and so they were taking sticks and poking at it, and of course the alligator's snapping, snapping the sticks. And so the crew feels sorry, they take the crate, they drive it to a, uh, a, a closet underneath the main stairs and they put them inside there. You'll hear about the alligator in a little bit. Don't let me forget. So the Sultana will start up river on April 24th, 1865, and it is going up river against one of the, the biggest floods in recent history at that time. At points, the, the water has, is three miles wide and that is because the levees and the dams and dikes and stuff like that have all been torn away you know, from neglect because the Army Corps of Engineers, they're busy doing other things during the war. They're building forts, they're corduroying roads, you know, they're, they're building emplacements and stuff like that. They don't have time to work on the, the levee system on the Mississippi River. So this is what the Sultana is going up river. And that is cold, cold water, April of 1865, April. Uh, you get all that snows up in Minnesota and, and uh, Chicago area and, and Missouri, all melting and running down into the, the Mississippi, and that's cold, fast running water. Sultana goes up river. Uh, eventually, it stops at Helena, Arkansas, where this photograph is taken of the Sultana. Um, a, a photographer was there. He just happened to see an amazing sight and turned his camera. Now, if you look at this, you can see how crowded it is on the decks with all these individuals. Uh, it was an amazing picture and it's, it's, it's a good thing that we were able to get this, this picture, that somebody was able to take a picture. But otherwise, you would never believe without seeing. This is where they say a picture is worth a thousand words. That right there just shows you. From Helena, Arkansas, they go up river to Memphis, Tennessee. At Memphis, they have one problem. They remove the 300,000 pounds of sugar from the hold but they never shift the guys from the upper decks. Now, as the a, as a, as a Sultana went up river and it passed other boats or went by towns, sometimes the guys would lean to the edges and wave to the other boat and the boat would tilt. That was with the sugar in the hole. Imagine what's gonna happen now that you've removed that. So they take the, the, the sugar out of the hole and the Sultana will then start up river. And it starts up here and it sort of follows this path. When it gets up to about here, notice it is going from one side of the river to the other. And as it's going across, the strong current is hitting the boat in the side. So now the boat is starting to tilt a little bit. You have your four boilers. There was four boilers on the Sultana. They're interconnected. There's water in all of them. But if you tilt it like this, the water from up here is going to flow down into this bottom one. Well, you still have a furnace underneath this top one, and it's heating that metal. Now, when you straighten back out again and the water flushes back into this upper boiler, it hits that hot uh, metal, turns to an instant steam. And if you had a pressure of 150, you suddenly got a pressure of 200. And at 2 o'clock in the morning of April 27, 1865, the Sultana boilers will explode. One explodes, and within a millisecond, two more. So three of the four boilers will explode. The problem is, is that it tore up right through the center of the boat and it tore the, the uh, uh, pilot house off. Steamboats normally lived uh, uh, about two or three years. That was the average life, lifespan of a steamboat. They were made of the, 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 the thinnest wood, painted with oil-based paint so they were flammable. Um, you either had mechanical problems or you, 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 the boiler would explode, you would run into a snag in the, in the river that would poke the, the hull or something like that. Um, if that happened, the pilots were told to jam the boat into the shore and let everybody rush off. And then you stood there and watched the boat burn. But when the pilot house blew off on the Sultana, it now becomes a floating hulk. There's no way to steer it anymore. The two, paddle, or the two pilot, or 
chimneys, smokestacks will fall. One goes one way, one goes the other way. Um, it crushes down. The one that fall, fell forward <coughs> crushed the decks down on top of the other. There's people sleeping on those decks. They're crushed down on top of each other. Guys were trapped inside there. This is 2 o'clock in the morning. They had no idea where they were or what had just happened. Some guys were blown off the boat. And if you could grab a piece of wood, you were a lucky one. Otherwise, here in this cold water, they were dying of hypothermia. They start, you know, naturally, once the, once the fire breaks out, they start jumping into the water. And they originally will jump off the, the boat from the, from the bow up here into the water. And then they realize, wait a minute, it's safe on the bow because the wind is blowing backwards. And it's the guys in the back that are starting to get the flames. The guys in the front are safe, so they stop this mad rush off the bow. But now the guys in the back are getting the flames, and they're jumping on top of each other, one after the other. And, uh, and you know, the guy, some guy that jumps in here, or suddenly gets a guy from up here jumping in on top of them. They were, and then as weak as these guys were coming from prison, they, then you submerge yourself in that cold, cold water. They were losing their strength, grabbing onto each other. Uh, most of the men were stripping down to bare nakedness to jump into the water because they didn't want anybody being able to grab their, their shirts and stuff. Um, we had the story of one man that had grown a big, long, luxurious beard while he was in prison. He wanted to never cut it off. He wanted to go home and show his wife. He was grabbed by the beard and ended up drowning because somebody had grabbed his beard. Uh, just terrible stories. Uh, there is a rescue boat that comes along from Boston. Uh, it was coming down the river from St. Louis and it saw uh, a light in the middle of the, of the water. And it, at first they thought a barn was on fire. As it got closer, they said, oh no, that's a boat. And it looks like cattle are jumping off of it. And as it got closer, they said, those are not cattle, those are humans. And they quick started ripping off shutters and throwing them in at doors and throwing it into the water. Uh, bales of hay, they're kicking off and they're, they're trying to save as many people as they can. They actually rescued about 150 people. And the captain, Captain John Watson decides, I better go down river. We're seven miles north of Memphis. I better go down river and warn Memphis what is go going on because I can't save everybody by myself. Well, he didn't really have to worry about that because the salt, the, some people had already floated down river far enough that they had warned the people at Memphis that the Sultana blew up. Problem is, is your steamboats are sitting there with cold boilers. They got to build those that steam up before they can get out. In the meantime, they're sending out their small boats to. to to and row boats is always to try to rescue as many people as they can. But again, this is like three or four o'clock in the morning now. It's still dark out. Uh, eventually, what happens is one of the paddle wheels will fall over into the water. The other one sort of cocks sideways, but the one falls into the water and it acts like a big uh, outrigger canoe. The water hits this and starts to spin the salt hand. Remember, I told you how safe it was on the bow because the wind is blowing this way? Well, now you're turning around until this one falls over. And now you're pointed this way, and the, the wind's still blowing, and the flames suddenly turn this way. And there is a second mad rush off the bow. But this time, there was no longer any pieces of wood and stuff that the, uh, that the first group had grabbed onto. And they had, they had thrown over the stage, the, the big stage planks and stuff like that. That was all gone. So now there's a second mad rush off the bow, and, and many, many more people are drowning and dying. Uh, Eventually, the Sultana is, will blow up there, uh, is across the river, and it will actually lodge into some tops of some trees. The water has flowed so high that the only thing above the water is the tree tops. The Sultana lodges into there. They tie it off. There were some guys that actually, after the flames had burnt down, they climbed back on, about 32 or 35 guys that climbed back on the boat. There are some uh, people from uh, Mound City that will come out with little rafts and save them and bring them back. And then, just like they said in the movies, just as the last guys were off and they were pushing their, their little raft back to land, the Sultana gave a shudder and will sink beneath the waters of the Mississippi. Um, before I go any further, I can just tell you that, that it was, um, we have found it, it is now under land. It's not in the Mississippi anymore, because the Mississippi has changed course. So over the years, once it sank, it was covered over with silt more and more and more and more built up. And then when the river changed course, it's now under about 12, 10 or 12 feet of, of, of earth in the middle of a soybean field, uh, a, a Arkansas soybean field. These artifacts I found, those are not, those are not from the, where the Sultana is. It's the tree line of this guy's property. Because over the years, 
stuff has built up with erosion and stuff has built up as he's plowed. And as his plow hits this stuff, he stops, he picks it up, and he throws it along the tree line. So if you go to the site of the Sultana, you don't look for artifacts where the boat is, you look for artifacts along the tree line. And there's less and less to find because we've gone out there with a couple of our Sultana Association group and everybody looks for little pieces and I don't think there's anything left. I got these years ago before our group ever went there. Um, in the morning, of course, the water was full of, of uh, people. Um, and I want to make sure, I don't want to forget one guy. I'm going to go back. Remember I told you about the alligator? Well, there was uh, a couple of people that were blown into the water, a man named John Simpson. Said he was like 16 years old. And he says, I wasn't worried about drowning. I wasn't worried about being broke. I was worried about the darn alligator. And he was going to come up and bite me during, in the middle of me floating down the river. But he didn't have to worry about that because there was a man named William Luganbeal with the 135th Ohio Infantry that also remembered that darn alligator. But he remembered the sturdy wooden box that alligator was in. <laughs> he went and he broke open that closet door, took a bayonet and killed the alligator, dumped him on the deck, grabbed the, the, the box, pulled it over, threw it in the water and jumped into it and paddled down to Memphis on his own little rowboat. So, <laughs> so Yankee ingenuity right there, let me tell you. Um, well, in the morning, the steamboats will, as the sun comes up, they see the river dotted. And now some of the steamboats and, and a couple of Union gunboats are there, and they start sending out their yawl, their, their yawls, their, their, their boats and stuff like that. They actually even start up steam and go up river to pick these guys out of the trees. <coughs> a lot of the guys were lodged in the tops of trees just waiting for, for to be rescued. Uh, uh, those that are brought back to Memphis are taken to five general hospitals. Luckily, Memphis had been captured fairly early in the war by the Un United States uh, Army, and it had been turned into a, a big United States Army uh, supply place. And they had, you know, if you were if you were wounded at, at the battles of, of Vicksburg or later on in the Atlanta campaign, a lot of times you were brought over to Vicksburg because they had some great hospitals there. Luckily for these guys. Those hospitals were there. They had the top doctors, the top nurses, and a lot of them, over 700 guys, are going to be admitted to the different hospitals. But they were also pulling bodies out of the water, and they were laying, lining the bodies up, and people were going up and down looking for relatives, looking for friends um, among the dead. A lot of them, most of them, were not found because of the flood waters. Um, they might end up you know, three miles in, and they get snagged on a tree, and when the river eventually floods down, these guys stuck two miles on land. Um, so, um, but, but uh, eventually Memphis runs out of caskets. They don't have enough caskets for the bodies that are being pulled, up, uh, pulled on board or on shore. Eventually they will put more, they will bury them, them in Elmwood Cemetery, which is still there in Memphis. It's a city cemetery. A year after this war, they open up a national cemetery and they, they want to re the bodies. They, they dig them up and they're going to bring them to the national cemetery. And they knew who a lot of the guys were because friends had identified them. And they, when they dig them up, they write on top of the caskets with chalk who this person is. During the night, there was a torrential rainstorm. <laughs> the names were washed off of the caskets. So now most of these guys are buried in the Memphis Cemetery as unknown U.S. soldier. Talk about adding insult to injury to these guys. It's just it's amazing what happened to the guys on board the Sultana. So how many people died on the Sultana? Out of the 2,138 people on board Sultana, 1,169 died, a loss rate of 55%. More than half of the people on board died. Now, you may look this up, and even in my book. Um, I wrote my book in 96. I said 1,547 people died. That used to be the, the, what people thought. The Titanic had 1,517. So we thought, aha. The Sultana actually had more died than the Titanic. Over the years, however, people have said 1,700 died, 1,800 died. I have found websites that now say over 2,000 died. Well, there was only 2,138 guys on board. And we know that at least 750 of them were taken to hospitals and they survived. So <laughs> something's wrong there. So a couple years ago, I, I retired from uh, uh, teaching. And I had been a police officer also, but I retired from that, became a teacher, retired from that. And so I started saying, how many died, did die? Is it 1,500? 
is it 1700? Is it 1800? And I really started doing heavy, heavy research. And I have found the grave sites of more than 900 survivors. People that died in 1913 or 1930. Well, if you died in 1930, you sure didn't die in 1865 in the Sultan. Not to be buried, you know, if they could do wonderful things with, with bodies, but not hang on to them for 50 or 60 years. Um, so, what I have determined is 1,169. Still a terribly high number, but less than the Titanic. Uh, there was uh, advertisement on the Sultana. The Harper's uh, Weekly had a woodcut about it. Uh, the, the river newspapers like St. Louis, Cincinnati, uh, Memphis, they all had great stories about the Sultana for many, many, many weeks. But the rest of the nation, the reason you, probably, you guys may not have ever heard of the Sultana, is because there was nobody. The people on board came from Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Michigan, and a handful from West Virginia. There was nobody from New York or Pennsylvania or the big Massachusetts, the big states that had the Boston, the Philadelphia, and the New York newspapers. Here is a New York newspaper here, a uh, New York Tribune. The Sultana made it, the last column on page four. <coughs> so if you, you know, if, if you didn't read the whole newspaper, you would have missed the story on the Sultana. Um, so once it was determined that nobody from those eastern states, they sort of lost interest in it. But not only that, but look what's happening at this time. Abraham Lincoln's body is being brought across the northern states to eventually be placed in Springfield. Um, they're looking for John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth will be killed one day before this. Well, what do you think the next day's newspapers have? Does it have the Sultana, or does it have the, the, uh, the, sh the shooting of John Wilkes Booth? They're looking for Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis, President of Confederacy, is on the run. Uh, Joe Johnson, the second largest Confederate army, surrenders April 26th, one day before this. So that's why the newspapers were so crowded that they crowded out the Sultana or put it on the back page last column. There was an author a few years ago that wrote a book called April 1865. We were really happy. It's, it's one of the most momentous months in American history. General Lee surrendering, Lincoln getting killed, Lincoln being brought here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When, when he got the book, we thought, oh, this will finally put the Sultana on it. We opened it up, no Sultana. We asked the author, we said, how come there's no Sultana? He says, there was just too much going on. I had to cut some stuff out. <laughs> the same thing that happened in 1865 happened in 1995 or whenever he wrote that book. We could so I didn't buy the book. I'll tell you, right, I don't recommend it. No, I never read it. I don't know. What would the Sultana, if the Sultana had been a battle, it would rank number 12 in the number of soldiers, northern soldiers killed. You've got Gettysburg, Wilderness, Antietam, Shiloh. Most of these are two and three day battles. They're fighting all day. The Sultana was five hours. Five hours. <laughs> that one wouldn't come out. Five hours. And you got, you got more than some of these battles at you know, the assault on Vicksburg. First Bull Run or Manassas, Franklin, Tennessee, one of the worst battles as far as the Confederacy. And this is where it would rank. Also, it ranks just below the loss of the USS Arizona in World War II. The Japanese attack and sank that ship, which is still there today, with many, many of those bodies still on board. The Sultana ranks just below the loss of life in the Arizona. Now, everybody remembers the Arizona, but how many people remember the Sultana? It's incredible. There is one person that will put, be put on trial for the Sultana, and that is Frederick Speed. Who is Captain Frederick Speed? He was out at the parole camp putting these guys onto the trains and sending them into town to be put on the Sultana. He never put a single person on the Sultana. But the problem is, is that the captain that was there, a man named George Williams, was a West Point graduate. He's one of, the, he's one of us. He's one of the Army. We're not going to go after a West Pointer. <laughs> you know it. Um, Reuben Hatch, why don't they go after him? Well, he had quit the service. He saw, he saw the writing on the wall, and he quit the service. They go after Speed. Speed is found guilty of overcrowding the Sultana. But when the Judge Advocate General looks at that, the top lawyer in the Army, he says, no, 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 no. This guy's a scapegoat. He'd never put a single person on board. And Judge Advocate Holt will say, 
that evidence shows that the Sultana was selected by Captain Hatch. He had cut the deal with Mason. Hatch is the guy we should go after. The accused, Speed, did in fact consult Captain Hatch, the officer who possessed ex exclusive authority in the premises. In other words, Hatch. Speed talked to him and said, are you sure they're all going to fit on the Sultana? Oh yeah, they'll fit, they'll fit, don't worry about it. He is actually down in New Orleans and he will escort Somebody's really making a big mistake. They will give him uh, 14000 let me back this up, $14,490 to escort from New Orleans up to St. Louis. They're giving him this money and say, here, take this to St. Louis. On the way there, the safe on the Atlantic is robbed. <laughs> well, people, when you rob a steamboat, all that steamboat has to do is anchor in the middle of the stream and search. And so, where are you going to go? <laughs> If you're next to the land, maybe the robber can jump off, but otherwise he's on there somewhere. Well, they actually catch the guy. They catch the thief, and they recover everything. Uh, they recover 5000 but they are missing $8,542 that Hatch had. Where's that $8,500? Hatch has no idea. But he's held responsible for it because he did not have a bonded courier with it. He was not supposed to carry that money by himself. But again, what happened to the... $8,400. Well, Hatch is honorably discharged from the military in July 1865. And Hatch will then take, and he's held responsible for this $8,500. And as I say here, what happened to that $8,500? <coughs> hmm. Remember that. Remember that number. Because Hatch will, with two other people, buy it into the Peoria, or the Joliet State prison. What had happened is during the war, prison labor was hired out to work on saddles and do farming and uh, make wagon wheels and cannon wheels and stuff. But the war's over, people. Now, now Hatch thinks that he can make money by buying into this with a couple of friends. It'll cost him, you know, initial payment and they're going to buy into this and they're going to make money on it. But the war's over. People aren't hiring uh, uh, prison labor, they're hiring veterans and they're putting these guys back to work and getting them as the wheelwrights and them as the, as the clothing manufacturers and as the saddle makers. So Hatchet ends up losing money, but he has to buy into this. It costs him, he becomes a one-sixth partner and it will cost him 8,309, I, I see it on your face. Well, where did he get $8,391? Hmm, the Steamboat Atlantic ring a bell? Absolutely right. That's how he buys his way into the Joliet prison with the stolen money. Well, what happens is he loses money on that deal because, again, people are hiring veterans. They're not hiring slave labor. And he really starts turning to the bottom. He becomes a full-blown alcoholic. Plus, he's got that terrible disease, the fistula and anal, um, which I laugh about, but, it, but I've heard that it is a terrible, terrible disease. Very painful. But People said that you know, he was frequently very much under the influence of intoxicating liquors. I've known him from 69 to 1870. I seldom have ever saw him sober. This guy is drunk all the time. Well, eventually what happens is here in Pittsfield, um, his brother-in-law, I guess it would be, uh, Bush decides, I feel sorry for this guy. He's, he's down on his luck. He's an alcoholic. He's got this terrible disease. I'm going to hire him to build a three-story brick Bush building which is right next to the hotel there. Although if you look at it now, it's only two story. They've removed one story. Well, Hatch is in charge of building this three story brick building. But once again, he cuts corners. He doesn't buy the right type of wood. He doesn't double brick the building and stuff like that. And during a terrible, terrible windstorm, the building, the brick building blows over. Yeah. So something wrong when a brick building gets blown over by almost hurricane type winds, but still, you know, that should not happen. Maybe a roof blow off, but not the building itself. Because of this, he really goes on a drunken binge. Uh, he ends up with the uh, DT, <coughs> detox, whatever that's called, syndrome. And, uh, and he ends up dying uh, uh, on uh, July 24th, 1871. He was only 52 years old. Now. Uh, he was, the, the, the doctor puts down that he dies from congestion of the brain. Mm -hmm. But really, it was congestion of the brain superinduced by alcoholism. His alcoholism killed him. But they tell the government that he dies from 
congestion of the brain. So he is given a pension. <laughs> and his wife is given a pension, I should say. And this, he's buried here in Griggsville, there in Griggsville. And you can see, Harvey Hatch, Colonel of the 8th Illinois Infantry. Ladies and gentlemen, let me back you up for a second and say, do you remember? He was a first lieutenant with the 8th Illinois Infantry. He wasn't a captain until he went down to Cairo, and he was a captain later on at, Vic at uh, Vicksburg. Even his headstone lies. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty bad. I can't blame him because he's already dead, but even his headstone lies. Now, Bob and I went out to his grave here at, up at Griggsville last, last summer. This is the Hatch family plot. This is the, the father's buried here, the brothers and sisters are all buried along here. In fact, this is the this is the, the uh, father's plot, and then here's all the graves. But this is where Reuben's buried. They don't even want him close to them. <laughs> so he's buried. He's, we were amazed when we saw them. Like, oh my God, look how far he is away from where his family is. So it's almost like they don't want him. He is buried next to next to one of his daughters that died of diphtheria, but. But it's, it's amazing that he is buried so far from the rest of the family uh, plot. Did he ever feel responsible for what happened on the, with the Sultana? Probably not. Um, he, he avoids going to the, they subpoena him three times to come to, three or four times, to come to the, the trial of that guy's speed. He doesn't show up. He had quit the service. And he says, I'm a civilian now, and I don't need to pay any attention to military orders ordering me to come down to Vicksburg and testify and stuff like that. Well, it turns out that he really did, but by the time that the military gets around to try to arrest him, the trial is basically over. And they have found Speed guilty. Hatch just avoids the whole thing. He just sort of goes in hiding and avoids. They actually send a sheriff out to try to arrest him, and he just stays in hiding. Did he ever feel responsible? Well, he said this. My skirts are clear. My skirts, and what they mean is the, the long jackets they, they used to wear came down pretty long, so they call them skirts. It says, my skirts are clear of the blood of those poor boys. No, I didn't have nothing to do with it. It wasn't me. He says, the fact that he continued to get embroiled into that stuff with the, the, the Atlantic, the stolen money, and the, and the get rich quick scheme here, I don't think this guy ever felt any responsible for anything. He was just a scoundrel. Um, it's too bad that his relatives and influential friends, including Abraham Lincoln, uh, had not seen through this guy's despicable veneer and removed him from service long before about 1,200 people lost their lives in the Sultan. If it wasn't for Lincoln and his influential friends, the governor of Illinois and Secretary of State, his brother, such and such, this guy would have been kicked out of the military a long time before, and we may not have had the overloading of the Sultan. This is our museum in, in, uh, Mem or in Marion, across the river from Memphis. So this is my advertising. Uh, and I, I do have some brochures here. If you ever go down to Memphis and you're going to go visit uh, uh, Elvis, go across the river and you have right across the river is West Memphis, uh, West Memphis and right above that is Marion, Arkansas, and that's where we want you to go. This is what our museum looks like. We have a 14-foot steamboat there, a uh, model of a steamboat. We also have, here's William Luganville, saved by an alligator. So it's a box that he had that he would keep his watch and his rings and stuff in. And so that's what he was known for for the rest of his life, saved by an alligator. Um, and that does it. Any questions from anybody? Cap uh, Captain Mason dies on the, on the uh, explosion. Actually, he lived through the explosion, but I never see him get off the boat. Um, the chief engineer did survive. He was up in his room and he survived. The second engineer was standing by the boilers and got blown out. He, he ends up mortally scalded and died uh, a little bit later. Uh, and I think that about, we, I told you about that, they have, that we have found the Sultana. Uh, we will never dig it up. A couple reasons we don't want to dig it up. Um, you saw what happened when Robert Ballard found the, the Titanic. And he, he, he let people know where it was. Next thing you knew, everybody and their brother were going down and diving and pulling pieces off of it, which is damaging it. Um, we don't want that to happen with the Sultana. Um, it is in, a, in the middle of a bean field. It's 260 feet long by 42 feet wide. It's about the size of, the size of a football field. That would be a big thing to try to excavate out of this guy's bean field. He doesn't want that. Uh, third thing is, uh, I was at a uh, steamboat conference in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I heard from a lady. She gave a presentation uh, about you know different steamboats that are being found here and there in the, in the waters, and the divers are going down. And they said, if if you find one human bone 
on that steamboat or that relic, you have to stop. It is considered a cemetery, and you cannot no longer dig there. Well, we know that there's got to be human bones because the way the decks crashed and crushed, so there's people there. There's probably bones still, just like on the, the Arizona. You know, they don't do any any going into that uh, in, in Hawaii. Same thing with this. Um, so we will never dig up the Sultana. There's few of us that know where it is. Um, every now and then, we will take uh, our Sultana Association people, descendants, and stuff like that. We'll go there. But for the most part, we want you to visit the museum in Marion, Arkansas, the closest town to where the remains of the Sultana is. That's as close as we'll let you get to it. So, uh, any other any questions? <coughs> yeah, I'm fine. Oh. I'm fine. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. The, uh, for those of you that may or may not know, okay, when we refer to the Bush Building, it is the building where the Hallahan and the uh, Henderson Law Offices are at. And at, at one time, it was a three-story building, and then the third story was taken off, what, sometime in the late 60s, 70s, somewhere in, in the there? 50s, I think. Okay. And, uh, but <clears throat> what happened in the spring, early summer of 1871, we had a terrible, all through the tri-state area had terrible thunderstorms and tornadoes. Wind, yeah, tornadoes. And we had either a, uh, what they call those, uh, like the or force winds, they call them now, you know, yes. and, and either that or a tornado came through on, I believe it was Sunday night. The roof on that building was not complete, and it caused the collapse of the eastern wall across the alley and into the implement company building that laid due east of it. And that is what happened. And that is what Gene's referring to that, uh, I wish I could remember that gentleman, that bush, that, uh, that uh, Ruben's wife was the brother to, that was the editor of the paper and responsible for building that building. That's why we call it the bush building. Uh, but that's, 